August 1964, the mighty F-8 Crusader catapults into history. Feared by all North Vietnamese pilots, this lethal fighter earns the nickname MiG Master. But as cannon give way to missiles, the Crusader becomes the last of the gunfighters. My fellow Americans, as President and Commander-in-Chief, it is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. On August 5, 1964, American aircraft from the USS Ticonderoga catapulted into history. For America, this was the beginning of the Vietnam War. As with Korea over a decade before, the US Navy was the first to engage the enemy on a large scale. Uninhibited by the diplomatic and logistical snares encountered when operating from foreign airfields, the Navy had been poised to strike well before Washington was ready to make that crucial decision. Most of the attack missions were carried out by A-4 Skyhawks, A-1 Sky Raiders, and A-6 Intruders. Operation Rolling Thunder was the prevailing military strategy during the early years of the conflict. It involved bombing the southern portion of North Vietnam and slowly moving northward towards Hanoi. The assumption was that the communists would give in as the bombing moved northward. However, this scenario underestimated the resolve of the North Vietnamese. Despite its daunting name, Rolling Thunder was a limited tactical approach. Often pilots could only attack targets that first attacked them, and crucial support lines from China were strictly off limits. But the aerial bombardment did take its toll. Under pressure from American attacks, the Air Force of North Vietnam was pressed into service. The most glorified North Vietnamese aircraft during this conflict was the Soviet-built MiG-21. However, the most prolific and effective fighter in Hanoi's arsenal was actually the older MiG-17. The MiG-17 was agile and very effective in hit-and-run attacks on American aircraft. To defend the vulnerable bombers from North Vietnamese MiGs, the Navy employed a fighter that since 1961 had been the pride of the fleet. The Crusader was arguably the greatest air superiority fighter of its time. Fighting MiGs was clearly what this plane was designed to do. U.S. Marine Corps Major General P. Drax Williams graduated from Cornell University and was commissioned in 1963. He flew his first combat tour in 1965 with the Marine Corps Squadron in Vietnam. Flying out of Da Nang, Williams flew perhaps the most dangerous missions of all, ground support for the Marines. Having risen through the ranks, he will always remember the plane that brought him home safely. This great old bird right here is the F-8 Crusader, once proudly known as last of the gunfighters. I flew it from 1965 to 1968 and did a tour in combat in uh, Da Nang in 1967 to 68. It was powered by a great big Pratt & Whitney J-57 P-20 Alpha, which won an award for being the first engine to sustain 10,000 pounds of thrust 
and basic engine. An afterburner, it would put out about 18,500 pounds of thrust. There are several interesting features about this aircraft. One of them is this unit horizontal tail. It didn't have elevators, and at the high supersonic speeds that the aircraft flew at, the whole tail moved up and down, which, of course, controlled the pitch. Another were these ventral fins right here. These were added on after several accidents as the aircraft was being catapulted off a carrier. Sometimes it tended to swap ends. These babies kept them straight. One of the very unusual aspects of this aircraft, unique in fact, is this wing. Most aircraft have flaps in order to slow down. This aircraft has no flaps. This wing raises up and the fuselage lowers. That allows the bird to slow down so the pilot can either land aboard a carrier or ashore. If due to some reason, battle damage, the wing doesn't come up, then he has to land in excess of 200 knots to avoid landing on the tail. At the onset of the Vietnam War, the Crusader was combat ready. In the early days of the conflict, it was used extensively as a fighter escort, protecting bombers from MiG attacks. Vectored to enemy aircraft by E-2 Hawkeyes and Super Constellations, the speedy Crusader would engage enemy fighters well before they could become a threat to the vulnerable bombers. It was in this role that the Crusader earned its famed nickname, MiG Master. High above the jungle mountains of North Vietnam, elite battles were waged between fighter pilots determined to secure air supremacy. Not unlike the dogfights of the Korean War, sophisticated American fighters met head-to-head -head with their non-Russian pilots flying Russian-built planes. The MiG-17, seen here in the gun sights of an American pilot, was indeed a formidable adversary. But the North Vietnamese pilots are generally considered less skilled than the Russians, and were thus thought unable to use the plane to its fullest potential. MiG-17 pilots practiced hit-and-run tactics, preferring to leave the scene rather than sticking around to fight. The Crusader was well respected by North Vietnamese pilots. In fact, there was an occasion where a MiG-17 pilot allegedly ejected from his plane when he saw a Crusader closing in from behind. This is rare footage of MiG-21s being shot down over North Vietnam. The first Crusader victory over a MiG-21 occurred on October 9, 1966, when a pilot deployed from the USS Hancock locked on to the Speedy Delta Wing and fired his sidewinder. Although the F-4 Phantom accounted for three quarters of all MiG kills in Vietnam, the Crusader boasts the highest kill ratio scoring 19 MiG kills with only three air combat losses. Despite the Crusader's superiority over the MiGs, air combat was always a harrowing experience. Some people say that flying is hours and hours of boredom punctuated by stark moments of terror. I think we got our, our share over there. I'll never forget, of course, being shot at. I don't think anybody ever will. That's the first time I think you're ever convinced of your own mortality. The Crusader, with its four 20-millimeter cannon, had developed a reputation as a gunfighter even before the outbreak of the Vietnam War. But it was the Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles that proved most effective against North Vietnamese MiGs. In fact, of the 19 MiG kills credited to the Crusader, only one was achieved solely through cannon fire. Here, a MiG-17 pilot is attempting to evade an onrushing Sidewinder, but it is already too late. In order for a fighter pilot to be combat ready when called into action, he must be well practiced in the elite art of aerial combat. This is Miramar, California, nicknamed 
Fighter Town, USA. In 1968, the Navy established fighter training school for its pilots. It was here that the Navy's two premier fighters first came head to head in a simulated combat. It is Crusader versus Phantom. In what is now known as Top Gun School, this mock dogfight training was underscored by the intense rivalry between the pilots of these two very different aircraft. As with the early dogfighters of World War I and the Spitfires and the ME-109s over the skies of Britain in World War II, the key is to get the enemy on the defensive. Although technology changes, fighter tactics remain the same. Crusader and Phantom begin their dogfight beyond the visual range of one another. Radar must be employed to find the adversary. But radar is a double-edged sword. Although it alerts the pilot to the presence of his foe, turning it on makes him the biggest target in the sky. The Phantom hunts down the Crusader. In a defensive maneuver, the Crusader makes a hard left turn, and the two planes meet head on. From now on, all contact will be visual. It is a classic dogfight. In the 1960s, the Crusader and the Phantom were arguably the greatest air superiority fighters in the world. And not surprisingly, the rivalry between the two was intense. The Crusader pilots saw themselves as true fighter jocks, uninhibited by the multi-mission role performed by the Phantom. Likewise, Phantom pilots joked the Crusader's cannons represented the technology of an older generation. But like all inter-service rivalries, it was that of two siblings. They were competitive, but when push came to shove, they were on the same side. To this day, Crusader pilots maintain that their plane is simply unbeatable. Rear Admiral Robert Smith flew the Crusader. Cleaned up and in a fighter role, it is the best airplane there is to fly. It is more fun than anything you can imagine. It's the hot rod, the sports car of uh, aviation. I've never met a person who who's flown it in aerial combat. Uh, dissimilar tactics or dogfighting in the old days who didn't really enjoy it. Now, to land it and bring it aboard a boat, now that's a different question. One of my most vivid memories is, uh, of course, bringing the airplane aboard ship. It was hard to bring aboard ship, always accelerating or decelerating, and if you didn't fly the airplane, it was gonna fly you. And then once you got aboard, if you got a perfect three-wire, which is the best pass you can make on a small carrier that was about 12 feet hooked to ramp clearance. And then the flight deck personnel were always trying to taxi you off the edge of the uh, carrier, it seemed, because the nose gear is about six or seven feet behind the pilot. So the uh, flight deck crew would bring you right up to the edge of the carrier, the nose wheel, the pilot would be over the water and you'd see nothing but water running by underneath. And you had to have an awful lot of faith in those young men. For an aircraft to perform as a fighter, it must be extremely maneuverable. But of course, in order for a plane to be made more agile, stability must be taken away. While instability is the friend of any pilot engaged in the chaotic game of aerial combat, during landing, it becomes his enemy. The Crusader's blazing speed and prowess as an elite Navy fighter draws comparisons to its famed ancestor, the F-4U Corsair. Like the Crusader, the chance fought F-4U was one of the fastest Navy fighters of its time. But also like the Crusader, it was unforgiving on landings. So unforgiving, in fact, 
that had earned an unflattering sobriquet, the Ensign Eliminator. For obvious reasons, the Navy was not fond of airplanes that were difficult to bring aboard a ship. For three years, this distinctive fighter with its inverted gull wings had helped to neutralize Japanese air power. But during this period, it only operated from land bases. Then something happened. Losing their grip on the Pacific, a desperate Japanese military began their infamous kamikaze attacks. Diving headlong towards American ships, these suicide-bent pilots could outrace any Navy fighter, except the Corsair. As kamikaze attacks became increasingly relentless, the Corsair was pressed into squadron service aboard U.S. carriers, where it would serve with distinction until the end of the war. By the early 1950s, jet-powered fighters had established a monopoly within the U.S. Navy. In the late 40s, the Navy had been suspicious of jets, citing their high takeoff and landing speeds as less reliable aboard a carrier than proven piston aircraft. However, the gradual acceptance of pure jet fighters took hold just in time. During the Korean War, the success of carrier-borne jets like the Grumman Panther and the Douglas Banshee proved that jet propulsion was here to stay. The Chance Vought Company had less success in the early days of jet aircraft than did their competitors at Douglas, Grumman, and North American. Its first attempt at a jet was the XFU Pirate, which never made it beyond the prototype stage. Vought's next endeavor showed more promise, at least on paper. The F-7U Cutlass was the first naval fighter designed with afterburners and swept wing. Despite its potential, the Cutlass was plagued with problems. Its weak climb rate earned it the nickname Gutless and its high accident rate made it unpopular among naval pilots. After producing two losers, Vought was falling from favor with the Navy. And in 1952, when the Navy released specifications for a new Mach 1 fighter, Vought had only one last chance to produce a winner. With their backs to the wall, the Vought team forged ahead with unprecedented swiftness. By June of 55, the Crusader took to the air at Edwards Air Force Base. On his maiden flight, test pilot John Conrad did the unthinkable. He went supersonic. After the familiarization flights came the most dangerous part of any flight test program, spin recovery. During a spin test, the pilot will drop over 30,000 feet in a matter of seconds. He must examine the responsiveness of a plane he is uncertain will even stay intact, all the while enduring the disorienting and physically punishing effects of excessive G-forces. John Conrad endured the brunt of spin testing for vault, and the Crusader never let him down. All of the early Crusader training was completed without the luxury of a trainer. In fact, it would not be until 1962 that a trainer would be introduced. Many pilots who flew the Crusader early on felt that this trainer came too late. Test pilot John Conrad explains. I must add that the Navy at that time in life did not believe in building two-place tactical trainers. The Air Force did. I feel that uh, the Navy might have saved several of the losses of airplanes by neophyte pilots had they been trained in the two-place airplane. 
The two-seat Crusader, or two-sater as it became known, was never widely used in the training of young Navy fighter pilots. So when the Crusader first entered service with the Navy back in 1957, pilots had to make their first flight alone. Initial carrier qualifications on the Crusader were carried out in April of 1956 aboard the USS Forrestal. Captain Duke Windsor made 12 catapult shots and 12 landings without incident. Surviving the ultimate test of any potential naval aircraft, the Crusader began its service career with the Navy. During Allied exercises in the Mediterranean, British Canberra bombers practiced mock attack missions on American ships. The impunity with which the high-flying Canberras carried out these attacks did not please Admiral Cat Brown of the 6th Fleet. When the fleet received its first crusaders, Brown used the occasion to teach the British a lesson in naval air combat. Canberra pilots were stunned to find this new American aircraft making vertical passes at their bombers. The British were not the only aviators to be outperformed by the Navy's rising star. Since 1955, the F-100 Super Sabre had held the world speed record of Mach 1.25. As the world's fastest airplane, this sleek fighter bomber was the pride of the U.S. Air Force. However, with the arrival of the Crusader, the F-100's records began to fall. In late August of 1956, Duke Windsor took the Crusader to Mach 1.5 shattering the F-100's record. A year later, a young Marine pilot named John Glenn would attempt a record-breaking coast-to-coast flight. It was called Project Bullet. We called it Project Bullet uh, because if it came off the way we wanted to, uh, to come off, which, which did work out, I would average uh, more speed from coast-to-coast -coast than the muzzle velocity of a 45 caliber bullet. What Project Bullet also achieved was to fuel the intensifying rivalry between the Navy and the Air Force. The Air Force had held the record. We wanted to break the record, and we did. In fact, we asked the Air Force if uh, they would loan us some of their jet tankers for this, and they refused. <laughs> the plane that we actually used for this was a photographic version which happened to have a little more fuel and also had cameras that would take side pictures as well as vertical pictures. And so we loaded all the cameras up and started them running at a, a regular speed, uh, taking off out of Los Alamitos. And I think we did the first uh, continual strip picture uh, clear cross country from west coast to east coast. While the Crusader was busily breaking every record in the book, Chance Vaught was aiming even higher. In 1956, they designed a plane that was meant to be the ultimate air superiority fighter. This is the F-8U-3, nicknamed the Super Crusader. The Super Crusader was an aggressive looking airplane, but although it shared the F-8 designation with its little brother, there were many differences between the two fighters. In 1957, the era of the gunfighter was already perceived to be nearing the end. Fearing that the Crusader was on the fast track to obsolescence, the Super Crusader would carry only missiles. Another difference was the addition of large ventral fins designed to help keep the plane stable at transonic speeds. Like the Crusader, the Super Crusader's wings lifted for better low-speed handling. But an additional five feet of wingspan and four feet of fuselage made it considerably larger. The larger airframe was supplemented by an enormous Pratt & Whitney J-75 engine that was meant to propel this fighter interceptor beyond Mach 3.
The Super Crusader was first flown by test pilot John Conrad in June of 1958. Later that summer, it would reach a blazing Mach 2.6, and in a final round of test flights late in the year, it remained the only competitor to the mighty F-4 Phantom. From a performance standpoint and an air-to-air -air combat standpoint, i.e. dogfighting standpoint, there was no comparison. The F-8U-3 would eat it alive. It was a much faster airplane and much more agile airplane than the F-4 was then or is now. Despite the impressive performance of the Super Crusader, the Navy opted for the twin-engine two-seater Phantom in December of 58. Following the Navy's decision, the F-8U-3 program was canceled, and all five aircraft were turned over to NASA for high-altitude, high-speed research. While the Super Crusader program was in the process of cancellation, improvements were being made to the original Crusader. The Vought ejection system was replaced by the British-made Martin Baker seats, which had developed a solid reputation within the aircraft industry. Because of the dangerous nature of carrier flight operations, the seat must safely eject the pilot at low altitudes, low speeds, and even underwater. Not surprisingly, most carrier accidents occur when the plane is coming aboard the ship. Naval airplanes are constantly subjected to crushing landings. Therefore, rugged landing gear is a must. When the Crusader experienced a disturbing series of landing gear failures, Vought engineers conducted an additional series of drop tests in an effort to strengthen the existing gear. In the late 50s and early 60s, the Navy had an insatiable appetite for higher and higher speeds. The massive Pratt & Whitney engines were upgraded, and at the beginning of the turbulent 60s, the Crusader continued to set the pace. Between 1953 and 1963, Cold War fears resulted in an explosive growth in military technology. In the early 50s, jet power was a fledgling technology, while in less than a decade, man was pushing the transonic envelope, and there was even talk about putting a man on the moon. As an early 50s design, the Crusader needed to change with the times. Most of the original Crusaders were taken back to Vought so that their electronics, radar, and weapon systems could be brought up to speed. The result was this, the F-8D. This improved Crusader contained the technologies necessary to maintain an advantage over even the newest Soviet fighters. However, the Crusader's first call to action would not be against Soviet MiGs. In October 1962, Russian missile installations were discovered in Cuba. 
For 10 long days, the world stood on the brink of war. When a high-flying U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba, the U.S. was forced into a different strategy. Photo coverage of Cuba needed to be at almost treetop level to evade Cuban radar. It was here that the photographic version of the Crusader met its first critical challenge. Dubbed Operation Blue Moon, one Navy and one Marine photo Crusader squadron began an intense series of low-level recon missions over Cuba. By the end of the conflict, 160,000 pictures were taken, and both squadrons were personally decorated by President Kennedy. During the Cold War, the U.S. and Soviet military engaged in a continuous game of cat and mouse. It was common for a Soviet bomber, the Tu-95 Bear, to fly over American carrier groups. The Bear was equipped to carry standoff anti-ship missiles, so it was not a threat to be taken lightly. When a Bear was approaching a carrier, Crusaders were sent aloft to greet it. Crusader pilot Hal Loney recalls one such experience. They had a bear and a bison en route to fly over the ship. Anyway, we get out there and we fly uh, by a uh, wing on the bear and a bison. I tell you, that's an eerie feeling. Uh, when when a, a gun is tracking you everywhere you go, just, just like that, looking in there. At the same time, these guys are standing in the windows with a Pepsi-Cola bottle. <laughs> The Crusader had been designed to chase Soviet bombers and tangle with Soviet MiGs. As a Navy fighter, it represented a far-reaching extension of U.S. military power, employed to thwart the perceived expansion of Stalin and Khrushchev. However, its baptism of fire would not be against the Russians. By 1959, the leadership of North Vietnam had become dedicated to the goal of creating a unified country. Conflict was nothing new to this region. In 1945, independence for Vietnam was claimed by Nguyen That Tan, known to the world as Ho Chi Minh. Beginning with a voluntary force of only 34, Ho Chi Minh built an army large enough to drive the French from the region. After the victory at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, Ho Chi Minh and his military mastermind, Le Zuan, began looking southward. Through a network of trails, bridges, and rivers, the North Vietnamese funneled supplies to the south to support a communist insurgency against the government in Saigon. From the very beginning of what would become known as the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese were totally committed to the war in the south. By contrast, the U.S. government decided to take a limited approach to the war. The strategy taken was to pacify the North Vietnamese military without implementing provocative measures that may have angered the Soviets. For aviators flying against the North Vietnamese, this limited policy was both frustrating and dangerous. Well, you're flying along and you, you can see a missile site down there, or a SAM missile sitting on the launcher, or a AAA, whatever, and you couldn't shoot at it because it was off limits. Unless it shot you or your wingman down, then you could go shoot at it. Well, it's, or you fly down the same road, the same altitude, five days in a row, and you knew sooner or later that, you know, they're going to figure out that, hey, Louis, here he comes again. Let's shoot him. And uh, those were frustrating times. When America entered the war in Vietnam, the North Vietnamese mobilized their entire population to the war effort. Every able-bodied person in North Vietnam participated in the defense against the Americans. Anti-aircraft gunnery accounted for some 85% of all U.S. aircraft losses over the North. Over the hostile landscape of North Vietnam, American planes weaved through the violent labyrinth of anti-aircraft flak that darkened the sky. To make matters worse was the presence of Soviet-built surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, which honed in on the powerful radar emitted from the sophisticated American planes. Right, 
In an attempt to quiet North Vietnamese guns, Crusaders were outfitted with a hard point on the port wing, enabling the pilot to fire Zuni rockets. Zuni rockets are an air-to-ground weapon used extensively in the suppression of anti-aircraft gunners in SAM sites. Many Crusader pilots saw themselves as fighter jocks, and they didn't cherish the idea of using their thoroughbred fighter in the role of ground suppression. Fighting MiGs is what the plane was designed to do. However, the military realities of Vietnam meant that many of these pilots would spend more of their time diving headlong towards North Vietnamese gunners than dogfighting with MiGs. Hurtling through the fray of artillery and ground fire may not have been the preferred mission of Navy Crusader pilots, but for the Marine pilots, it came with the job. Not all Crusader squadrons operated off the decks of carriers. By the end of 1965, most Marine squadrons were consolidated at Da Nang. Marine Crusader pilots were responsible for combat escort, flak suppression, and ground support. It was here that Major General Williams flew his first tour with the Marines. 235, the Death Angels. Uh, I joined them in Da Nang in summer of 1967. And uh, within a week, we were flying uh, combat escort missions for the bombers up north. We would uh, take off loaded with uh, guns and sidewinders and fly fighter escorts for the A-6s going up to, uh, to bomb North Vietnam. Pretty exciting for a young kid on his first combat tour. On the ground, U.S. forces were fighting an increasingly difficult battle. The North Vietnamese fought an ambush style of warfare that often caught besieged army and marine platoons by total surprise. When an attack was underway, embattled ground forces depended heavily on air support. Using either radar-controlled beacon or radio, the forward air controller could give the aircraft the exact location of the enemy. Although the intruders and Skyhawks were the Marines' primary ground support planes, the Crusader carried out this job with lethal proficiency. The Zuni rocket was a simple yet effective weapon. Screaming down towards the target called in by the ground troops, the Crusader pilot simply aims and fires. One tactic used in the ground support role was to fire Zuni rockets with phosphorus warheads into the target area. The black smoke rising from the impact point provided a target that the onrushing dive bombers could easily identify. It is difficult to measure the success of close air support in the Vietnam War. As rockets and bombs disappeared into the thick jungle canopy, the best a pilot could hope for was news that his ground troops had been reprieved. The best missions were obviously the ones we flew in support of our ground troops. That was the most satisfaction when the guy on the ground would tell you, great job, you just saved a bunch of my Marines' lives. As with all naval aviators, the mission is never complete until the aircraft comes back aboard the ship. There is a saying among aviators that flying is man's second greatest thrill. Landing is the first. This is especially true of a carrier landing at night. There were uh, many medical studies done in Vietnam during the war where pilots over a period of years were hooked up with heart monitors by the flight surgeons in the squadrons. And uh, the results were the same every single time. The heart rate of the pilots coming back aboard those carriers at night was always higher than it was when they were in combat over North Vietnam. 
As the Vietnam War dragged on, the Crusaders' involvement steadily decreased. In 1967, the F-4 Phantom logged more flight hours than the Crusader for the first time in the war. Like the great Navy fighters of World War II, the Crusader was a gunfighter. But by the late 60s, air-to-air -air missiles and beyond visual range radar had rendered the gunfighter obsolete. Also, the Navy's growing aversion to single-engine planes coupled with an aging airframe resulted in its eventual replacement by its longtime shipmate, the Phantom. Many of the retired crusaders found a home with the navies of France and the Philippines. NASA found the speedy gunfighter a valuable tool for research and photography. Like the famed Corsair of World War II, the Crusader's role as a fighter remains only as a proud chapter in the history of Vought. In June of 1989, the last of the gunfighters prepares to take off for one final flight. The Crusader retired as a Navy fighter in 1976, the same year the Navy retired the last of its small Essex-class carriers. Considering the long relationship between airplane and ship, this dual retirement was appropriate. The Crusader would continue in its role as a photo bird well into the 80s until it was replaced by the F-18 Hornet. There is really no modern equivalent to the F-8 Crusader. For the past three decades, the Defense Department has demanded that all new aircraft must perform a variety of functions, from aerial combat to bombing. Multi-mission aircraft have forever replaced the proud line of pure fighters that began in World War I and ended with the Crusader. As the last of the gunfighters departs Andrews Air Force Base, another chapter in naval aviation history is closed. December 1941, Pearl Harbor lies in ruins. But the arsenal of democracy strikes back, and within months, thousands of pilots will fly a plane built by automakers. A plane created with one purpose, to avenge Pearl Harbor. I can vividly remember everything about this. Over a half century ago, an unsettled world burst into flames. Years of depression and isolation had cultivated the perception that America was buffered from such distant world conflicts. However, as the war widened, America was forced together in a unity unprecedented in modern society. This collective spirit, intent on the achievement of one goal, would become known as the arsenal of democracy. There is perhaps no better living example to the arsenal of democracy 
than this Navy bomber known proudly as the Avenger. Forged by the hands of men and women, automakers and seamstresses, machinists and housewives, the Avenger is a monument to a time in American history when the people of an entire country dedicated their lives to achieve a single goal. America desperately needed the tools of war to support a generation uprooted to fight in a distant land. Left with no alternatives, the arsenal of democracy would answer the call. The Avenger was given its name while the billows of black smoke were still rising from the decimated Navy base of Pearl Harbor. To avenge the Japanese attack was the call of this torpedo bomber, and avenge it would, as Japanese battleships and German U-boats would be quick to realize. From the Battle of Midway through to the last day of the war, the mighty Avenger served not only as lethal Navy bomber, but constant reminder of what a united America could achieve. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese Navy launched over 360 planes from six carriers that were within striking distance of the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor. American servicemen and civilians at Pearl Harbor had no idea what was about to hit them. The Navy's Pacific Fleet units at the base comprised over 70 combat vessels and 24 auxiliaries, most of them moored for the weekend. Of eight battleships in the harbor, five were sunk, one severely damaged, and the other two hit. Two destroyers were also sunk, while 140 aircraft were destroyed with another 80 damaged. Luckily for the Navy, its three carriers were not in the harbor during the attack. However, the deaths of over 2,300 military personnel struck a nerve that would prompt a quick American entry into the war. Remember Pearl Harbor would remain the battle cry of the Navy's Pacific Fleet for the next four years. Exactly three months to the day before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the prototype of a new Navy torpedo bomber flew for the first time. The plane was Grumman's entry into a design competition intended to replace the aging torpedo bombers of the 30s. Although this prototype won the contract, there was one problem. Grumman was already mass-producing fighters, and its plants were reaching overload. As this new torpedo bomber began its production run, it was clear that eventually Grumman would need to find someone else to help build it. The day after Pearl Harbor, the U.S. government ordered a curtailment on all automobile production. Immediately, the assembly line shut down and thousands of auto workers became unemployed overnight. General Motors representatives scrambled to find government contracts in an effort to keep their plants open. In an effort to procure small contracts like making wheels for a bomber or wings for the P-47, GM got much more than they had expected. As a result, the auto company needed to form a new division. GM veteran Cliff Goad was made general manager of this new division. His son, Thomas Goad, remembers this rapid chain of events. They were, they thought they had a potential to get the P-47 wing. And that was when the, the, uh, they happened to walk into the War Department, a member, someone from Linden, uh, this investigation team that was trying to find a contract. And uh, just at the right time that the government decided that Grumman had this neat new torpedo bomber, the Avenger, that they were starting to build, and it was going to be the backbone of a Navy uh, carrier-based bomber. Desperate for a contract, General Motors accepted the challenge of making airplanes, and the Eastern Aircraft Division of General Motors was born. The transition from making cars to making planes was a mammoth one. The ominous threat from the East touched a fear which transcended all levels of American society. 
The American perception of the Japanese Empire was that of an unrelenting military juggernaut determined to control the Pacific and beyond. An invasion of America was expected as newsreels of the ever-expanding Japanese war machine bombarded theaters around the country. For the American worker, this threat provided ample motivation to begin this most difficult task. She has spun around herself a web of powerful bases and major strongholds. Every base is supported Under by tremendous the pressure, GM dedicated five plants from Terrytown, New York to Baltimore, Maryland. The first challenge was the conversion of these plants into airplane production. Of course, number one, you gotta clean the plants out completely. You just move every piece of equipment out of them. You don't wanna just scrap it, because anything you can save, you wanna put in a warehouse so you can, when the war's over, you know you're gonna go back to building cars again. So you wanna be able to save all the equipment so that you can set up again just as quickly after the war. Over five miles of conveyor equipment needed to be torn from the Linden, New Jersey plant alone. At the Trenton plant, an airfield was built to test planes as they rolled off the assembly line. But the Avenger was a massive plane, the largest carrier-based plane of its time. Therefore, several plants needed to be expanded just to fit it inside. In the case of the Linden, they had to have one section of the plant that they had to raise the roof. And so when they had the assembled airplane, that they could take it down through that bay with a tail sticking up in the air to be able to clear the overhead rafters. As GM officials scratched their heads over sprawling sheets of airplane blueprints supplied by Grumman, they realized that their greatest challenge would be finding people that could build an airplane. They had to go and recruit from all over General Motors uh, engineers and people with skills in airplanes because the aircraft companies were not, they couldn't afford to let any of their people go. Uh, the government said that you couldn't. You had to build these airplanes with your own people and uh, you can learn as much as you can from the aircraft companies. Go visit them and see what they do, but you can't have any of their people because they need those people to build the planes they're already building. A great task was underway as men and women from around the country pulled together to make the tools of war. There was much work to be done, and with war raging, there was little time. On June 4, 1942, the Japanese Navy spearheaded their largest offensive since the attack on Pearl Harbor. This time, the target was the U.S.-held island of Midway. Unlike the attack on Pearl Harbor, U.S. forces knew that it was coming. Japanese planes were already well on their way to the island before the Americans had a chance to attack the enemy carriers. The Japanese attack on Midway Island was massive and unrelenting. For the United States, the Battle of Midway was a must-win situation. If the Japanese were not stopped, they would solidify a land base within striking distance of Hawaii, furthering their grip on the Pacific. Only days before the Japanese attack, six Grumman Avengers were sent to Midway Island. These six planes were the first Avengers to see action at the front. For two tense days, young Navy pilots, fresh out of an abbreviated training course, awaited their fateful call to duty. The rest of the torpedo bombers assigned to take on the Japanese fleet were the outmoded Douglas Devastators already aboard the USS Hornet. For torpedo bombers, the Battle of Midway was an outright disaster. Late in the morning of June 4th, deck handlers aboard the USS Hornet awaited the return of 15 Douglas Devastators that had left that morning to attack the enemy fleet. However, the men aboard the Hornet would never see their planes again. All 15 Devastators were shot down by Japanese Zeros, and only one pilot managed to survive. Of the six Avengers that left Midway that morning, five were shot down. In one day, Torpedo 8 had lost 20 planes and 44 men. 
Despite the decimation of Torpedo 8 at Midway, it is important to note that their sacrifices were not in vain. The hero of the Battle of Midway was a Navy dive bomber, the Douglas SBD, known on the carrier decks as the Dauntless. It's true that these dive bombers were responsible for sinking the Japanese carriers, but to say they could have done so without the presence of torpedo bombers ignores the facts and is a point which has eluded many historians. At the Battle of Midway, the torpedo bombers were the first to arrive. Immediately, Japanese Zeros swarmed the low-flying American planes while anti-aircraft gunners kept the advancing torpedo bombers in their sights. With all eyes fixed on the action near the surface of the ocean, the dive bombers swarmed down from above, taking the Japanese ships by storm. It was a classic high-low attack. And in the end, four Japanese carriers were destroyed. By the evening of June 4th, victory at Midway had been achieved. This was the turning point of the war in the Pacific. Back at General Motors, a very different battle was underway. It was the battle to get aircraft assembly lines moving. Automotive employees were still coming to terms with the elusive skill of building an airplane. And with much of the workforce off at war or already working in other plants, GM tapped a resource that during the war would become the backbone of their workforce, women. Even before the war, women had proven to be accomplished seamstresses and had long since dominated the labor force of the garment and textile industries. For seamstresses, the shift to airplane production was an easy one. Airplane wings and tail sections were made largely of fabric, and women were used extensively in the sub-assembly of these parts. But in World War II, women would do much more than sew. Thus emerged Rosie the Riveter. It is unclear whether there ever was a true Rosie. She's really more of a mythical figure, a symbol of the American woman during World War II, a woman who put down the knitting needles and picked up a rivet gun, a woman who took off her bonnet and put on a welding mask, Rosie transcended all racial boundaries. She was both rich and poor and would work long hours with the sole intention of making a better plane that would be flown by her sons and brothers. Under the watchful eye of a concerned Navy, she drilled, sanded, riveted, and welded side by side with her male counterparts. Despite the dedication put forth by the employees of Eastern Aircraft, teaching automakers to build aircraft was an arduous process. To help this process along, Grumman supplied General Motors with two PK ships. Grumman engineers built an Avenger, but instead of using rivets, they put the plane together with Parker Callon fasteners. They then shipped the plane to General Motors where the PK fasteners could be removed. The PK ships proved to be the valuable reference the automakers needed, and as the summer of 42 gave way to autumn, the Avengers at the GM plants were beginning to take shape. On November the 11th, 1942, an anxious crowd awaited the first flight of the GM-built Avenger. The first flight was crucial, not only because it would prove whether or not the plane worked, but it would show these automakers that they had truly built a machine that could fly. This is the TBM. The TB stands for Torpedo Bomber. The M was the Navy's designation for General Motors. The Avengers that flew at the Battle of Midway held the designation TBF, F being Grumman. Aside from the Navy designation, the Grumman TBF and the General Motors TBM are the exact same airplane. They had to be, because the Navy ordered that their parts be interchangeable. 
Here, the bomb bay doors can be seen in the open position. Within those doors would lie the torpedo known by Avenger pilots as the fish. The Avenger is a large airplane. A massive 1,700 horsepower right engine was needed to get it off the carrier. Sturdy wheels, designed to withstand punishing landings, are the trademark of all Navy planes. This is especially true for the Avenger, which was the largest carrier plane of World War II. The Avenger had three crew members. One sat in an electrically controlled ball gun turret towards the back of the fuselage. The pilot sat in front of a large greenhouse-style canopy, while the bombardier who released the torpedoes, bombs, depth charges, or mines sat in the rear at the back of the bomb bay doors. By the end of the war, close to 10,000 Avengers had been built, carrying almost 30,000 aviators into harm's way. One of these aviators was a young high school student named George Bush. On his 18th birthday, Bush passed up a college opportunity and enlisted with the Navy. He wanted to fly the Avenger. I chose torpedo bombers. I, I, I wasn't some of it was that I didn't think I was a particularly accomplished uh, fighter jockey, one of these guys doing all these uh, maneuvers. Secondly, the plane had great appeal to me. It was a team effort. There were three of us in the airplane. It was a stable aircraft. It was the largest carrier aircraft. So I asked to be trained for torpedo bombers, and I never regretted it. It was risky, of course, but uh, that just went with the territory in those days. After Bush got his wings in the summer of 43, he began training in his new Avenger, which he named Barbara after his girlfriend back home. Ensign Bush was assigned to Torpedo Squadron 51, deployed to the light carrier USS San Jacinto. One of the things that impressed Bush most about his new vocation was the teamwork involved both on and off the plane. You had a crew, you had a team. Um, I don't know whether you can see this, but in the back of the, behind the pilot, there was a turret, and you had a turret gunner in there, and then in the bottom of the airplane, you had what they called a stinger gunner, a tail gunner, and uh, they helped keep the plane up. We'd wash our own airplane, uh, the cr our crews. We had a, flight, a crew captain on the, on the deck, on the carrier, but it just came together. You got to know them well. You shared experiences with them, and I've always liked team sports, team effort, even in the White House. And uh, so I think it, that team concept had an appeal to me uh, when I decided to try for torpedo bombers as opposed to fighters. As with all naval aviators, Bush needed to get used to life on a boat, which can be treacherous. I guess my first recollection of the Pacific was these enormous high seas. And this was a converted cruiser hull, fast carrier. She ran with the big CVs. And uh, it, uh, it was hairy. I, one of our guys subsequently killed, turned absolutely green. I mean, you've heard of people get seasick and turn green. This guy was green. The seas were rough. We couldn't fly in a, that kind of weather. But again, it was just part of, part of our maturing as a, as a squadron. Only days after George Bush enlisted with the Navy, the United States had begun an all-out offensive against the island of Guadalcanal. In September 1942, the first group of Avengers began to arrive at Henderson Field at Guadalcanal. The Avengers were part of an air group assigned to knock out Japanese shipping in the area. Although Avengers had only been in the service for three months, they had already earned a rather unflattering nickname. Marine Corps General George Dooley explains. It was called a turkey. And why was it called a turkey? Well, because it sort of looked like a turkey. It sort of lumbered through the air, and in comparison to the F6F Hellcat, which it closely resembled, it was not nearly as uh, attractive. During World War II, there was an urgent rush to get Avenger pilots and their crews to the South Pacific. General George Dooley had less than a month to get familiarized with his Avenger and his crew. 
Such abbreviated training often resulted in confusion during battle. General Dooley remembers one such occasion. The turret gunner was a tech sergeant, John Dewey. And John Dewey called out, seeing an enemy aircraft coming, banded at 12 o'clock. Well, actually, it was a banded at 6 o'clock. Pilots were all looking at 12 o'clock, and suddenly we realized that he had gotten twisted around, but he made up for it by shooting down the aircraft. For American torpedo bombers, Japanese Zeros were only half the problem. In order for an Avenger to guarantee a successful torpedo run, they needed to go very low and very slow, making themselves easy targets for the gunners on the ships. And at that time, the torpedo that we were using was notably unreliable. Our tactics that we used was to come in at 200 feet and at 200 knots and to have the needle and ball all in the center and everything leveled and let the torpedo go. And hopefully it was going to get a good run. And if you're going in against an enemy that's shooting at you with everything it has, uh, the one thing you're going to do is want to get a hit. As the Battle of Guadalcanal raged on, Navy planes began to strike powerful blows to the Japanese fleet. In a mere two-day period in November of 42, the Japanese lost two battleships, three destroyers, one cruiser, and 11 cargo vessels. General Dooley flew against the mighty Japanese battleship Kenugasa. When we were getting to the torpedo release point, some gunner on the bow of the ship, the Kenugasa, zeroed in on me and I had uh, uh, little red golf balls rolling all around my left side of my aircraft. I finally had to settle down getting to the torpedo release point. At this point the gunners started hitting me uh, in the port wing and all you could hear was that as these shells were hitting home. We released and I went home and I, on the way home I nursed the aircraft very carefully not knowing whether or not the wing was going to stay on. As it turned out, when we got home, the wing was very sturdy. It could have taken any number of Gs and still held up. The mistakes made at the Battle of Midway would not be made at Guadalcanal. Torpedo bombers now attacked ships with the full protection of Wildcat and Hellcat fighters lurking overhead. By early 1943, American naval fighters had learned the tactics of effectively taking on their skilled adversaries. It's true that sheer fighting experience improved American chances in their elite battles high above the clouds over the South Pacific. But it was really the emergence of a new fighter, the F-6F Hellcat, which would tip the balance to the American dogfighters. Since 1941, the Grumman Corporation had been concentrating on production of their new fighter, the F-6F Hellcat, which would be much more durable than its predecessor, the Wildcat. The government wanted Hellcats, and it wanted them quick. With the war escalating, Rosie was promoted from Riveter to pilot. The Women's Air Service Patrol, or WASP, was a group of highly skilled female pilots who delivered Hellcats to the West Coast to help fulfill the urgent demands of the Navy. Although never officially sanctioned by the Army Air Corps, they are a proud chapter in the long history of Grumman. By the summer of 1943, the Grumman Aircraft Company was dedicated almost exclusively to production of the coveted Hellcat. By this time, the U.S. Navy was not the only customer. England wanted them too. The Women's Air Service Patrol busily hurried the planes to Navy units on the West Coast as well as to the Royal Navy on provisions of Lend-Lease. By January 1944, Grumman stopped production of Avengers altogether, concentrating solely on the Hellcat. So confident was the Navy in General Motors that all of the Avenger production was now put into their hands. In December of 43, the 1,000th Avenger had rolled off the assembly line at the GM plant in Trenton, New Jersey. The next 1,000 would be produced in less than a third of the time. 
Eastern Aircraft General Manager Cliff Goad had developed such a respect among aircraft industry leaders such as Larry Bell, Donald Douglas, and Glenn Martin that he was named Chairman of the Aircraft War Production Council. Cliff Goad's son, Tom, also developed a new respect for aviation. We've lived and breathed airplanes then, and I've made models of, of uh, the Wildcat and the Avenger, and, and I dreamed of being a Navy flyer someday, and uh, uh, it was it was very inspiring, you know. Allied victories at Guadalcanal and New Guinea had made it clear that the Japanese were on the defensive in the Pacific. U.S. naval forces had begun an island hopping campaign intended to secure communication and supply routes from Australia and establish air bases from which the airplanes could strike further into Japanese-held territory. With the island hopping campaign in full swing, Avenger squadrons found themselves being used in the close air support role for Marines landing on the beach. Each Avenger could carry four 500-pound bombs. Used against entrenched Japanese troops on the beachhead, a squadron of Avengers delivered a formidable punch. After days of bombardment that softened the Japanese defenses, the 7th Infantry Division and the 4th Marine Division landed on the Kwajalein Atoll. By the end of the first week of February, most of the resistance on Kwajalein had been overcome. The Navy had planned to move further into the Marshall Islands in mid-April, but Japanese resistance had been so weak at Kwajalein that further marine landings moved forward ahead of schedule. Searching for any remaining pockets of enemy resistance, U.S. Marines waded through the decimated landscape wrought by days of aerial bombardment from Navy Avengers. By the end of the Marshall Islands campaign, more than 600 Americans had been killed with 1,800 wounded, while Japanese casualties numbered over 9,000. Just two weeks after the landing, airstrips were constructed and Avenger squadrons were preparing for the final push towards Japan. In June of 1944, the U.S. fleet was consolidating their grip on Saipan and Guam. At the same time, one of the most historic battles of World War II was heating up. The Battle of the Philippine Sea was the largest aerial battle ever staged between two carrier forces. This showdown of naval aviators would become known to Americans as the Marianas Turkey Shoot. High in the skies over the Philippine Sea, the Hellcat fighter reigned supreme. On the first day alone, the Japanese Navy lost 156 planes to American fighters. To avoid confusing torpedo bombers with their Japanese counterparts, Hellcat pilots carried something that is usually considered a child's toy, model airplanes. The uh, Air Force or the Army at that time made uh, these, they're made out of a very hard plastic material and they uh, used them to help train the pilots on identifying aircraft. They were normally just an all black plastic, and they had these on, on all the Allied planes and all the, uh, the German and Japanese planes so that they could help uh, teach the uh, pilots and the aircraft gunners the various uh, airplanes so they could identify them. With a blanket protection of fighter cover, Avenger crews could concentrate more on dropping bombs and torpedoes than fending off Japanese Zeros. Relentless bombardment softened Japanese resistance, and by the end of June, nearly all of the Marianas Islands were under U.S. control. With the Marianas secured, the Navy was ready to move on to the crucial island of Guam. By late 1944, the Japanese forces were clinging to their last remaining outposts in the South Pacific. In October, the American fast carrier forces began their final push against the Japanese as they headed for Okinawa in Formosa. 
As the war in the Pacific dragged on, Avenger squadrons were used more for bombing missions than in torpedo attacks against Japanese shipping. From Luzon to Mindoro to the liberation of the Philippines, Avenger squadrons pounded relentlessly at an enemy that was quickly losing his grip on the war. In a last attempt to stop the onrushing American fleet, the Japanese reverted to desperate measures. Men of the U.S. Navy Escort Carrier Group, Taffy-1, were stunned to find Japanese aircraft plunging headlong toward their ships. This was the first Navy group to be subjected to the infamous kamikaze attacks. Blackening the skies with a fierce hail of anti-aircraft fire was the main defense against a suicide bent pilot. And although a few managed to hit American ships, most kamikazes found only the ocean, the end of their dive. Undaunted by the new threat of the kamikazes, the American fleet pushed onward to the Bonin Islands, only 750 miles south of Tokyo. The main island of interest was Iwo Jima, which the Allies wanted to establish as a base for fighters that would later protect the B-29 slated to bomb Japan. In February and March of 45, Avengers were involved in the two Iwo Jima campaigns in the role of close air support for the Marines. Close air support was crucial, and after one of the most bitter struggles of the war, the victorious Marines raised the flag over Iwo Jima. Although the U.S. Navy was steadily winning the war in the Pacific, the daily challenges faced by naval aviators were unrelenting. Landing a plane on a carrier deck with only one wheel is not something Navy pilots had trained to do. It was something they had to learn on the job. In World War II, there were no ejection seats. If your plane was crippled, you had three choices. You could attempt to jump out, ditch the plane in the sea, or land on the carrier, as does this Hellcat pilot. Jumping out of a crippled plane was usually the last resort of any pilot. Parachutes were notably unreliable. And there was a risk of being hit by the tail of your plane on the way out. Landing on the water was generally a safer bet but only if the plane was responsive enough to turn up wind and be gently touched down. If the plane was still flyable, a carrier landing was the preferred option. But it too could be fatal. The danger of flight was something the automakers of General Motors had to persistently remind themselves of. Weight was no, no problem with a car. In fact, people liked the heavier car because it, they felt it, it rode uh, more safely. It was a better riding car. It was a safer car. But airplanes, every ounce of weight was very, very important because the lighter it is, the more it can carry, the more ammunition, the more guns. The better fighting machine it can be, the faster it can be. It's just a very different attitude. You had to build it light, strong, and rugged. The Avenger was rugged. And in the proud tradition of the Grumman Ironworks, it proved time and again that it could take significant abuse and still make it back to the ship. However, for Ensign George Bush of Torpedo Squadron 51, September 2nd, 1944, was a day when his Avenger would never make it back to the ship. Taking off from the USS San Jacinto that morning, Bush was embarking on a mission that would change his life. Well, it was a, it was a, you know, it was a momentous day in my life that I will never forget. September second, forty-four, uh, early in the morning, uh, we had flown over uh, Chichi Jima the day before, 
and uh, so we were to go back again the next day. The target was a heavily defended radio station. With the fleet moving south, the station had to be hit on this mission. This was the last day that the fleet was going to be under uh, Admiral Michener in the north. Task Force 58 was soon to become Task Force 38 under Admiral Halsey. So I knew that the, sh the fleet would, would be leaving that evening. We'd been told that. This is your last mission over the Bonin Islands. Fleet's going south. Uh, which came to haunt me later on when I was floating around in the water because I say, hey, if they're going south and I'm sitting up here, it won't be too good. On the way to the target, the four Avengers split into two pairs. Bush and his wingman would hit one radio station and the other two Avengers would attack another station. It was a rather clear day. Flute climbed about uh, 10 or 12,000 feet. Uh, got the signal from our squadron leader to push over into a dive. We were doing what they call glide bombing. This plane was designed not to go st almost straight down like a, like a dive bomber, but in a glide. And uh, we were carrying four or five hundred pound bombs. My target was a radio station. And the minute we got over the target or near the target, we could see that we were in for a rather warm reception because the flak was all over these angry black puffs. And I pushed the plane over into a dive and uh, got halfway down. Uh, seeing this stuff breaking all around you, you, you could feel the plane go up like this and suddenly it was engulfed in smoke and fire. And uh, I did manage to finish the bombing run and, and uh, pulled out over the ocean and uh, made a turn so the people in the back could get out. After giving his crew members time to jump out of the plane, Bush himself climbed out onto the wing. It was very scary. You couldn't hardly see the instruments. And I jumped and pulled the ripcord too early, and I hit my head on the tail of the airplane and ended up with a great big, like, a strawberry in baseball, you know, when you slide, just rip the skin off. And ironically, the chute had hung up on the, just for a moment, on the tail of the plane, ripped some of the uh, uh, panels out of this high cut parachute and I looked up I kind of was dazed by that came to and there I was floating down into the Pacific you could see the Japanese island right there very clearly uh, landed in there uh, I'd forgotten to hook my seat pack and so one of the fighter pilots dove down and showed me where that was I fl swam over and got it uh, inflated it climbed into the raft and proceeded to set the record for the fastest uh, yellow raft in the history of the Pacific, trying to go away against the wind, away from this uh, island of Chichijima. A Hellcat pilot strafed a Japanese boat sent out to capture Bush, who was alone in a life raft with little protection. I was carrying a 38 caliber pistol. I knew enough about those islands to know that, that they were not kind to prisoners when they got them. In fact, the co commandant of that place was later tried on a war crimes trial and was hung for eating the liver of the pilots. So uh, I unflexed my 38, not knowing what the hell I'd do with it. And uh, fortunately, didn't have to do someone else in or myself in it. After nearly three hours in the raft, Bush saw something emerge from the water 100 yards away. This footage was taken aboard the American submarine USS Finback when it rescued Bush from the waters off Chichijima. In 1945, General Motors built their 7,000th Avenger. Only four years earlier, they were making cars, and by the end of the war, they had produced over three quarters of all the Avengers for the Navy. This monumental conversion effort did not go unappreciated by President Truman, who visited the plant with the Secretary of Defense and a group of very grateful Navy admirals. Before Japan officially surrendered on September 2nd, 1945, Avengers were operating in airfields throughout Japan. From their tragic beginning at Midway to their successes against U-boats in the Atlantic and to their triumphant ending in Tokyo, the plane that came to symbolize the arsenal of democracy was there through it all.
Could industries throughout America ever again come together as they did in World War II? Well, if we were told we can't build any more cars and we're going to have to do something with our people, I'm sure we would learn how to build whatever product the government wanted us to build to support whatever major effort to, we were going after to win a war or whatever it is. I think that's just the American spirit. The Avenger served with the Navy until 1955, but never again in a combat role. During the Korean War, it was used extensively for the transport of cargo from Japan to the fleet. With the onset of the Cold War, the Avenger landed an important role in the Navy's quest to hunt down Soviet submarines. Several other Avengers, such as the Sea Search variant that was fitted with a large searchlight in the bomb bay and the electronic countermeasures variant, flew briefly for the Navy. The Avenger still flies today. From Alabama to Arizona, the pilots of the Jet 8 generation fly through the peaceful skies in the living relic that once brought terror to Japanese ships and German U-boats. Now the Avenger sees most of its action at air shows and reunions, flown by pilots who carry on the legacy of an earlier time, a time when an unsettled world burst into flames a time when the industries of America pulled together in their own bitter struggle to become one strong and unified arsenal of democracy. Mm -hmm.